All right, where to begin? I've got a lot of things to say this morning. So some of you may already know, and some of you don't. And um, this morning's sermon is prompted by a lot of backlash that our church has received very recently. Uh, there's one of our church members, Brother Devin Rogers, preached a sermon a couple months ago while I was out of town. And the, the title of the sermon was Christian Privilege. And he talked about white privilege, and he talked about, you know, basically how our mindset should be as Christians, that it shouldn't matter whether you're black or white or whatever color your skin is because we're Christians, right? That was, that was what the sermon was about. And in the midst of the sermon are some things that were called out and some wicked mindsets that are, that are out there today. And there's a lot of, of people who believe different things, whatever. Of course, we know that. And... Um, uh, some small clips were made of his preaching and, and were recently spread around social media. I believe it started TikTok, which, if you know anything about the social media stuff, TikTok is, I would say, the, the total garbage dump of all social media. So if you don't like social media to begin with, I'm with you. I'm not a big fan of social media. We use it to, to, to put some good content out there. But uh, of, of all the social media that's out there, TikTok is just like the home of just kind of the worst of the worst when it comes to ideologies and, and, and the, the downward spiral of morality that this country and, and the world is headed down, it seems. So that's where it started, and it was no surprise to get a lot of flack from there. But we've had a lot of different types of people. I was trying to categorize because I've received, as a result of this, you know, people have been sharing it across different platforms and we've been receiving phone calls and messages and, and comments and all kinds of stuff saying how horrible we are and, you know, that, I mean, some of the comments have been like this and, and, and just to share with you, right, like, first of all, you have to understand this church, we don't, we're not hiding anything. Like, I don't, we don't try to shove stuff under the rug, like everything's above board, right? If you wanna know what we believe about anything, be happy to tell you exactly what we believe. We don't hide what we believe, which is why we broadcast it to the internet, okay? When people say negative things about us, hey, I'll address it. That's what I'm doing this morning, right? Um, I don't feel like I really need to necessarily for you sitting here, but maybe, maybe there is someone who wants to hear my response since it wasn't my sermon that is getting this attention. And the only thing that I'm upset about is that it's Brother Devin getting all the hate and not me. I, you know, I kind of wish I was in his shoes because the Bible says that, you know, um, to leap for joy when you're falsely accused and when, and when people are just slandering your name, essentially, I'm paraphrasing, but because that's what they did to, to, the, to the prophets, right? Like you're in good company. People are just going to start spreading lies about you, which it is. There's a bunch of lies going around saying that, you know, we're, that one of the, one of the comments was people of color aren't welcome here. Okay. Well, take a look around, right? Obviously these people have never been to our church. They know nothing about our church. They saw a TikTok video and now all of a sudden they're just going to be these experts on what our church is like and who should attend here and, and things like that. I've heard people say it's violence like that we're violent against black people. I've heard all manner of, of, of different types of comments, but, there's, but there is a big range. So there's people kind of pointing out different problems with what was taught in that short clip, in the five minutes or whatever long it was that they, that they decided to extract and cut out. So I'm gonna address some of those issues that people were trying to point out and as Christians, we have a Christian worldview, right? Now, some of these people who were commenting were not Christian. So I don't really want to spend a whole lot of time on that because the world isn't going to, like, they hate Christianity anyway. So you bring a biblical response to something that people don't like that's in the Bible, then I mean, you're not going to necessarily win them over, right? Like, they don't care about it anyways. It's, they use this to say, oh, see, this is why Christianity is so bad anyways. It's like, okay, well, whatever. And, and I've had people come and say, this is what, you know, because of what he said, I left the church. It's, really, it's like some guy at some church somewhere in America said something and that's why you're I don't think so. No, let me call you a liar right now. That's not the reason why you left, okay? Because you really care what some random person says at some church out of, I don't even, I mean, how many churches are, exist in America? I don't even know what the number of thousands of church are, hundreds of thousands or whatever, like just all over the place. People say all kinds of different things. So one person says one thing, you're not even, you've never even been to our church, and that's going to make you leave the church. 
Like, there's not just the church. They're churches. And there's a reason why. They're all independent because you could go to one that you think is right. So it, it would take literally all, it would probably take hours to go through every single comment that we've had on this subject. So I'm not going to do some all, so I tried to group them up into different categories. But I wanted to start here with a very familiar story because this is the essence of what was being preached anyways. It's found in the story of Joseph. Okay, and Joseph has so much to teach. There's so much great wisdom being brought forth in the book of Genesis regarding the life of Joseph himself. Joseph, as we see, see here in, in Genesis chapter 37, he was loved of his father. He was, he was someone that was special among his brethren. He was also someone that had these dreams, of uh, a, a pro prophetic dreams, that he was going to be lifted up, that he was going to be exalted. In fact, everyone was going to be underneath him, and he was going to be ruling over people. And his brethren didn't like that. It kind of rubbed them the wrong way. It kind of got them angry with him. Now, there's many similarities and many prophecies that we could see in symbolism between Joseph and Jesus Christ himself. And that would be one of them, right? Jesus Christ uh, being ultimately the, the king of kings and lord of lords and his own people even hating him and putting him to death. Well, this is a similar story in the sense that his own brethren wanted to kill him. So they hated him so much. It wasn't just they, you know, they got annoyed with what he said. They hated him. Because you don't go trying to kill someone that you love or you're just annoyed with. They hated him. And instead of killing him, as we saw in this story, they decided, hey, how are we going to benefit from this? What does it profit us if we just kill him? So they decided to sell him into slavery. Now, what I'm going to be doing is, and I look, I know... And this is why it's important to get things in context, too, by the way, because a lot of statements are made to set up the whole context of something that's being taught. Okay, it's a really difficult concept to grasp, right? But I encourage you, if you hear something that you don't like, if you hear a sound bite out of someone's mouth, go and get it in context. If you really care about uncovering the truth and you really want to know what's being said, Get the whole context. I literally had someone message or ask the question on Google, are you going to, you know, I forget uh, what, what exact language was. It was, it was like rebuke or, or, or is Devin Rogers still preaching at your church and all this other stuff. Or are you going to, what? I can't remember the word. It wasn't repudiate, but essentially it was, it was that, right? Are you going to say that that was wrong? What, what he taught. And I said, Brother Devin Rogers, my response was, he taught a sermon that was 100% against racism. So no, we're not going to say that that was wrong. And I said, did you happen to listen to the entire sermon? Response, well, I didn't listen to the whole sermon, but you need to do this, 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 and you tell me what I need to do with our church. Okay. You didn't even listen to the whole thing. It's, 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 uh, it's indicative of people who get triggered they get angry. They let their emotions take control. They're not interested in hearing anything. They're not interested in uncovering, well, what is the actual truth? What is the message? And let me ask you this. If you're going to listen to someone and hear, now, now, is everything that I say or anyone else for that matter says, is it always just going to be 100% said and stated perfectly? Especially when you're up here preaching for like an hour? Do you think everything that comes across my mouth is just going to be so eloquent, just perfectly stated? No, but do you think you could get the meaning and the context, like, like with the whole sermon, with the context of what I'm trying to say? I mean, you ought to be able to, right? So if I'm saying for an hour, racism bad, God's, you know, we're all one race, it's a human race, it's God made us all of one blood, and, and just going on and on and on and on and on throughout the sermon. And then one thing stated, oh, can you believe he said this? Oh, see, that's what's really in his heart. It's like, he's been talking for an hour against this, and then, and then it's like, you're going to find, you're going to snip apart one sentence and say, see, that's what's really in his heart. He's really, he's really a, a, a bigoted KKK member and all this other, non and look, People said that. I'm not just making this up. This is what was said in the comments. 
in my messages, in the emails, in everything I've been receiving, I've been looking at this going, these people are nuts. They're nuts. And you need to be aware of that too, if you're, if you're not already, right? That, that people are going to be trying to attack every word that comes out of your mouth, especially if you're trying to preach the Bible or just preach truth. Um, it, it's the people are going to come and attack. So let's look at this story. And I want to draw some similarities to slavery in general with this particular story of Joseph, because I think there are a lot of similarities that we could make between what happened to Joseph and what happened in this country with the Atlantic slave trade going back hundreds of years ago. Okay, we could see some similarities between these stories. And what we should do as Christians is have the right worldview on these things and have the right attitude on these things based on what's taught in scripture. And that's the attitude, and that's what's right, and that's how we should view these things, and that's how we should move forward from these things, and that's how we should address these issues, is based on what's taught in Scripture. That's what Christians do. So to the non-Christians that want to ridicule and, and, and criticize what we believe, whatever. Right? I, I, there's nothing I can do. You need to get saved. You need to trust the Lord. Amen. Okay. I'm not going to argue over these topics with you. You just need to, you need to get saved. So let's look at what happened to Joseph here. Starting in verse number 23, the Bible says, And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And they sat down, excuse me, to eat bread. And they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let our, not our hand be upon him. For he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. So we've got multiple people involved here. We've got his own brethren capturing him and selling him off to slave traders, right? Now, from what I've learned in history, a lot of that happened also in sub-Saharan Africa in, the, in the, the, the Atlantic slave trade, where a lot of people were captured, and there was a lot of wars being fought, and the wars were fought literally to support the slave trade, and people were captured and were sold into slavery. That's a fact. That's what happened, right? From a lot of times amongst people who could have been near of kin or at least near in proximity to them, right? It's a fact. That's what happened. So I could see a little bit of a similarity here in what happened with one person versus what happened to groups of people. Uh, flip over to chapter 39. Verse number 17, we see some more hardships that fell upon Joseph as a slave. And, this, and she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant, verse number 17, which thou hast brought unto us, came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass, as I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled out. And the story, if you don't know, was that Joseph was being a really good servant. And, and was doing everything he was supposed to do from his master and, and really was doing a good job, serving well. And then his master's wife wanted him to lie with her carnally. She wanted to have a relationship with him. And he was like, no, like, I can't do that. How can I possibly do that? Your master's been great to me. No, I can't do it. And she wanted to more, like, try to force the issue, and he ran away from her. And in so doing, you know, his coat or whatever, his garment was left behind as she's like holding on to it and he's just like let me get out of here so then she turns around and falsely accuses him of trying to do something to her and of course he's found guilty and everything else and it's you know even even this very story and this very concept if you're familiar with the story to kill a mockingbird it's kind of the same thing right you had a a, a, a a black man, I, I don't know, he, I don't know if, it, I guess at that time probably wasn't a slave, but it was still, um, 
this this racist thing going on with someone who was oppressed and then uh, this girl that was accusing him of doing something he shouldn't have done, right? It's the same type of a story here that's happening. And look, people who are in this position, especially a slave position, it's gonna be a lot harder to get justice, right? When people are already looking down on you and using you in that way, of course, right? So this kind of makes sense. And it says that Joseph's master, uh, or so verse number 19, and it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, after this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. Well, of course, he's going to believe his wife, and, you know, he's going to get angry about it, right? And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. Now, a lot of evil, a lot of bad things happened to Joseph. His brothers hated him and wanted him dead, but instead they sold him into slavery. He was serving as a slave and then was falsely accused and went to prison. And then in prison, he's still doing his best to, to, to better his situation. He still hasn't lost his faith. He's still trusting the Lord. God still blesses him. And then finally, he gets to this point where he's freed from jail. He's elevated in status and becomes a ruler, right? He, he's no longer a slave. He's... he's been promoted, God has freed him, and now he's in a new position. But I want to point out, and turn if you would to Genesis chapter 50, is Joseph's attitude. Because this was one of the big points that Brother Devin was trying to teach, was the attitude about these things. Because we need to maintain a godly attitude about bad things when they happen. Because bad things happen! It's a fact. They've happened. They've happened in the past. They're going to happen in the future. And we need to maintain the proper attitude about these bad things as we move forward. And how are we going to learn that from Scripture? Well, let's take a look and see what Joseph did because Joseph was a godly man. Joseph never lost his faith. Joseph was elevated by God. And Joseph is this image or this representation, this picture of Jesus Christ himself. And we see in chapter 50, after... Their dad has passed, okay? Now his brothers are worried because nothing has happened bad to them. In fact, when Joseph revealed himself on his brethren, he's like, hey, come and live in Egypt. There's a lot of bad years coming. We'll take care of you. Everything will be great. Come, move, and be here. Be with us here in Egypt. So they all move there, but then it's like, well, wait a minute, though. He's probably just being nice to us because... You know, he's, what could he possibly do with dad still around? But then dad passes on and they get all worried about it. And they're thinking, well, now he might come against us and get vengeance because of what we did to him. Right? So that's their concern. Verse 15 in chapter 50, the Bible reads, And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. For they did evil unto thee, and now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the, of the servants of the, God, of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And there's that ultimate fulfillment of his dream, right? I mean, they're falling down, and he's standing there and saying, We be thy servants. But they're looking for mercy. They're looking for forgiveness. They're repentant in their heart for what they did, but they're worried about what he's going to do. Let's see Joseph's response. Is he bitter? Is Joseph saying, Yeah, you know what? Too bad. Look at what you did to me. Now you're all going to pay. Now you're all going to die. You wanted me dead. Well, look, I'm still here, sucker. Now you're going to be dead. You know, now I'm killing you because that's what you deserve. And you know what? That is what they deserved. By the law, by the law of God, that's what they deserved. They stole their brother. They sold him into slavery. They deserve to be put to death. That's what they deserved. But how did Joseph treat it? Let's see his response. Verse 19, And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? Why did he say that? Well, first of all, God's the one who brings vengeance. 
He doesn't need to bring vengeance. God will do it. I'm not in the place of God. Yeah, you did some really wicked things, but you know what? I'm going to let God deal with those wicked things. But as for you, verse 20, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Amen. When you did this to me, you wanted evil against me. But what did God want? God brought good out of it. God used a bad situation to bring about good, yea, to save many people alive. Many people lived as a result of the suffering and the enslavement of Joseph. Why is it such a stretch? Why is it so terrible of a thing to say that in the United States of America, when the slave trade was going on, some people suffered really bad things, being enslaved. However, God was able to use that to bring a people to Christ and save many souls alive. Amen. Why is that a terrible? I, don't, I still don't understand that. People have this kind, and this is what people are freaking out about. This is one of the things that people are freaking out about. Yeah. They'll say things like, oh, so you think that, the, you know, you need to enslave people to get them saved? No, I don't. That's not what's being said. You think that, well, don't you know that the gospel was in Africa way before it ever came into Europe? Way before, like, yes, yes, I do know that. I am well aware of that. We're not making any argument about that. Not even close. You need to learn real history. You don't know your facts. You don't know anything. You don't know what you're talking about. You're not listening to what the point is being made in the sermon. You're not getting it in context, especially, and you're just making claims. You know, people make these claims. Don't do that, by the way. Don't start making assumptions and making claims about people that you have no idea about. You know, people always want to go, you don't know this. How do you know what I know? How do you know? You can't just make the claim to the world, you don't know. That. You're like, okay, do, do I not, though, really? Do I not know that? You're missing the point is what the problem is. It's not that I don't know history. It's that you're missing the point. And, you know, here's some history. And you know what? This matches up perfectly with everything I've already believed and Brother Devin's believed and, and whatever. But I'm going to read this because people are saying, oh, don't you know the gospel was around? It was well around. But you know what? For 1,500 years, wilder than then still all of these uh, heathen tribes and heathen people worshiping false gods. Yeah, there are other ways for people to get saved, absolutely. But what happened? There are still tons of tribes that are not Christian at all. Does that mean there are no Christians in Africa? No, of course not. Yes, there were some Christians. And yes, some of those were enslaved and brought to America too. But see, Brother Devin didn't go in depth on all those things because it didn't matter to the point. The point is that some people, out of a bad situation, God brought good just like he did in the story with Joseph. But here's a brief history, again, to answer the critics that want to, oh, you don't know your history, this, that. I do know my history, okay? Maybe you don't know your history. I know where Egypt is. And you know what? By the way, Egypt isn't a good place in Scripture. I've seen people trying to say, like, oh, well, Joseph was informed to bring Jesus into Egypt. So that, like, like that somehow just makes Egypt a great place? Because he was trying to avoid him from being killed by Herod when he was a baby. Like, th th how does that make Egypt a good place? Now, look, I'm not saying that because Egypt was a bad place that that means black people are bad or that means Africa's bad or that... I'm not, but see, that's what people will do. Oh, so you should, no. Egypt is representation of the world. Egypt is historically uh, anti-God and, and against the things of the Bible. Absolutely. And that's how the Bible uses it, especially symbolically. And that's where, and that's it. And that's it, right? So 
I'm going to read this for you. A brief overview of black religious history in the, in the United States. It's from Pew Research. Okay? And this probably won't come as a shock to any of you. But the vast majority of those who were enslaved were not Christians. And that's what Brother Devin was trying to express is that, look, people ended up getting saved, whether it was the actual slaves who came over here or their descendants. Right? People ended up getting saved as or after coming here. And that's a fact. And you can't, you know, no matter how much you hate, you may hate that fact. It's what happened. And we look at that and we say, wow, this is really similar to what happened to Joseph. I think I see God at work here in a people that have been humbled, that have been brought into bondage, and then God brought deliverance, and God brought freedom. And now that's like a bad message, apparently. Here's a secular article that reads, two-thirds of black Americans are Protestant, like about four in 10 Americans overall. The relationship between black Americans and Protestantism is unusual due to the history of slavery and segregation, which spawned the creation of several black-led denominations that allowed black Americans to worship freely. Most, mostly founded prior to 1900, these historically black Protestant denominations also supported colleges and helped black communities in other ways. The faith of Christianity was helping these people that were oppressed to be able to get resources and, and things to help them grow, right? First of all, that's kind of interesting. At the same time, Protestantism alone does not define the black religious experience in the United States. Of course not. Before enslaved people in America began converting to Protestantism in sizable numbers during the 1700s, they commonly followed traditional West African religions or Islam. That's history. That's a fact. Before they were enslaved and brought here, they tradition, before they converted to Protestantism, they maintained their West African religions or Islam because they were both major groups of people that were enslaved that came over here. Catholicism, too, has long had a presence among black Americans, including in Maryland, Kentucky, and Louisiana during the slavery era. And in the early 1900s, Islam began attracting thousands of black Americans with the message that Christianity, like America writ large, had failed to offer them equality. What follows is a brief account of black religious history in the United States with an emphasis on efforts by religious groups to deal with racism and its effects. When they were first captured and taken to America, some enslaved black people were Christian. More were Muslim. So this is what I say. Some of them were Christian. Absolutely. No arguing that. More were Muslims. So more people than were Christians were Muslims. But the largest number by far were followers of traditional religions common in West Africa at the time. Many of these African belief systems included a supreme, distant God who created the world in a pantheon of lower gods and ancestor spirits who were active in daily life. Now, if a person, regardless of their skin color, subscribed to this religion that's being described here of a, of a common that by far was, was the most common of those that came over here, if they subscribe to that and they held to that belief to the day they die, where are they going when they, when they died? Hell. They're going to hell. Where they're going to suffer way worse things than being enslaved here on earth. Because you're literally burning and being tortured and tormented for eternity. I could understand where people might get upset that don't even believe hell is real. But if you believe hell is real, and that the people who are practicing these religions, unless they find Christ, hey, that's where they're going to end up. Right. Now look, I know that Christians, evangelical Christians, lived in Africa at the time. But this happened. This happened. Evil people did evil things, and this happened. And, and you might even argue that 
God made it happen, judging people who are living and worshiping idols and in and, and these false religions, that it made him angry. Amen. That wouldn't be a stretch either, but I don't really feel like going and proving how God has done that in the Bible. Just read the Bible for yourself. You'll see that he does that with wicked nations all the time. Okay. This religious heritage also included the use of herbal medicine and charms applied by specialists known as conjurers who were believed to be able to heal disease, harm an enemy, or make someone fall in love. Historians say access to a conjurer gave enslaved people a sense of empowerment and control over their lives while allowing for a worldview that distinguished them from slaveholders and connected them to Africa. So a lot of the slaves, they wanted to be different from the slaveholders and they held to this religious view where they also had some element of power because they would use you know, spells or, or potions and other things to, to try to have this power, right? That appealed. This is, this is just a historical essay on, on the history you know, just of, of what happened here in the United States in a general sense. And when Brother Devin said, whether well, practicing voodoo or whatever, he said that because it doesn't matter what the false religion is. Voodoo was one of those false religions, by the way, that was practiced in West Africa. Absolutely, 100%. I mean, where do you think it came from in the French Quarter now in Louisiana? Like, like there's still voodoo being practiced today. Where do you think it came from? So yeah, some people were practicing voodoo, and the reason said, well, whatever, because who cares what all the other religions are? If they're all false religions that send people to hell, it doesn't matter which one they're following. Amen. But listen to this. It says, interactions between enslaved people and Christian missionaries and other evangelists led to the spread of Christianity among black Americans. That sounds like a good thing to me. Many slave owners initially resisted these evangelistic efforts partially out of concern that if enslaved people became Christians, they would see themselves as their owners' equals. Because that's what Christianity teaches, that you are equal. And that's what we teach, and that's what we believe too. So you notice there's a difference here between the evangelical Christians and some of the people that wanted to enslave the others. You notice the difference. So one of the reasons why Brother Devin gets upset and preaches some of the things he preaches, which is the same, could be the same reason why I would preach, is when people want to look at you and look at your skin color and just associate you with wicked people who abuse slaves. And then you're not going to call yourself racist. If you look at my skin today and you say, you're a white man, your people oppressed my people. No, look, you don't know anything about my people. First of all, my people are sitting in this room with me right now. That's how I identify. I don't identify with some heritage going back hundreds of years. I don't even know where that goes to. But I'll tell you this much, my parents were first generation, you know, after the, you know, my grandparents were first generation here. We didn't own any slaves. So now what are you going to do? Oh, but you're still the white devil. Why? Because of, the con because of the color of my skin? And you know what? That makes me angry when you're going to falsely accuse me and call me wicked and say, I am oppressing the black person today. I haven't done any of that. Amen. So yeah, it kind of gets me upset. The same way that it ought to get you upset if someone's going to start talking about your skin color and saying why that is somehow a, a, a bad trait or something that, you, you know, if I say, oh, you're black, you must be a criminal. That should make you mad. That should infuriate you. Why does it matter? And Christians were around in this country because they fled their own persecution to help found this country, which is why this is a Christian country. By the way, learn your history. The people who were doing the most works for God over, the, over across the ocean fled and came here because they were being persecuted. So you have a lot of people that fled and sought refuge from persecution who wanted to preach the gospel. And they came to this country. 
And then they found the fields white on the harvest with all these slaves that were brought over that knew nothing of Christianity, or maybe they did know, and they were, you know, whatever. There's all these people that were not Christians. And they're helping them to come to Christ. That's a good thing. I'll keep reading here. By 1706, this fear by slave owners had spurred legislation in at least six colonies declaring that an enslaved person's baptism did not entail their freedom. So, yes, people in charge and people in power were freaking out about this, some people at least. Not everyone, by the way. There was a battle, there was a struggle, there were people who fought on, on different sides of the issue of all colors. Also, by the way. Because many of the people who delivered the slaves from Africa were also black themselves, just in case you didn't know that. They weren't all just the white colonizers doing it. They weren't. Now, you could say they were incentivized by the money of the white man, maybe okay, but th they still were involved in the, in the capturing and sale of slaves, just like Joseph's brethren were. It's a fact. And some people here, they didn't like that now these people are getting saved and they're getting baptized and they're thinking that makes them free. Like, oh, hold on a second there, right? So yeah, we know there's a history of this stuff. And, and yes, it ought to be taught against, sure. But why is it so bad to say that God brought some good out of a bad situation? This is one of the main accusations that we've been accused of. In addition, many enslaved people who did become Christians had to deal with restrictions by masters who forbade them from attending church or prayer meetings to get around these restrictions and for alternatives to sermons by white clergy asking them to obey their owners. Many Christian enslaved people held secret services with distinct styles of praying, singing, and worship. These services were typically held in their cabins or in nearby woods, gullies, ravines, and thickets. Historians say the biblical story of the Israelites Escape from Egypt provided a good deal of inspiration to the enslaved people. Yeah, for good reason. This was reflected in coded lyrics to some of their religious songs or spirituals. In Go Down Moses, for example, lyrics plead with the Hebrew prophet to tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. Frederick Douglass wrote that when he was a child, before he had escaped slavery, a keen observer might have detected in our repeated singing of O Canaan, sweet Canaan, I am bound for the land of Canaan, something more than a hope of reaching heaven. We meant to reach the north, and the north was our Canaan. Sure. No dispute over any of this history as historical fact. That's what happened. I have a little section here on voodoo and stuff, but it really doesn't matter just saying how how it came to America. You, you could do that research on your own. I don't want to take up too much more of the time because there's a lot more scripture to look at when dealing with this. But I'm trying to, to bring up what people are saying. And if you just listen to what's being said, instead of looking to find something and, and, and you already have your mind made up, and you already want to find a racist, yeah, well, you're not interested in the truth then. And unfortunately, that's a mindset in some groups and in some areas that is being taught to children. There's some black communities that are teaching their children, hey, don't trust the white man. Watch out for the white man. The white man is why you're being oppressed. The white man is why you don't have anything good going for you. The white man is the cause of our problems. You tell me that doesn't exist. It absolutely exists. The same way you've got groups of white people saying, hey, the black people are bringing us down. The black people are the reason why our country is decaying. The black people are the reason why, you know, it exists. And it exists amongst people in general. You could find the groups that do that very thing, and you know what? They're all called racists. Right, man. Racist, the historical, normal, 
definition of the word racist, where someone's going to judge uh, uh, another person based on the color of their skin. If you're going to be uh, have, having your, you know, any sense of value determination based on someone's skin color, you're a racist. It's that simple. But these days, the, the woke people who like to make stuff up, by the way, like to change definition of words. I literally had someone tell me when I was out soul winning back in, in, uh, in Macon, when we did the Macon soul winning event, ran across these crazy people that were saying that, because they, they, they were saying racist stuff to me. I'm trying to preach the gospel, and they keep on bringing up the color of people's skin. I'm like, why do you keep talking about this? I want to show you how Jesus Christ, you know, and, and they just would not get off of it. And I said, you know what? You're racist. And they said, no, I, I can't be racist, all this other stuff, because they, they, there's this, this definition that people are adopting, some people are adopting, that racism means prejudiced plus power. So if you don't have any position of power at all over anyone else, then you can't be racist. And what they argue is say, well, see, black people institutionally are not in power because there's way more white people in government and in position of power than there are black people. So black people can't be racist. Stupid definition. Yeah. What happened to I have a dream? That mentality, look, I'm not for Martin Luther King Jr. in general. He's a guy's a false prophet and did a lot of wicked things. But I am, I am okay with the sentiments that he made, at least in that speech. There's, I'll read these for you. And this was, I think this is spot on. He said, I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I think that's a good thing. But some people, I think, don't want to have that happen. There's some people out there that just want to cause division and cause fights and want to find any reason to find racism or to find people that hate it just that's what they're looking for and partially probably because they've been ingrained with this for a long time in their head another portion of that which is even more famous uh line i have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character I think that's good. It's a very good thing. That's, that's what we ought to be judged is the content of your character, not on the color of your skin. I don't really see that being promoted today in many groups that are, that are out there, and, and many people have kind of gone the opposite direction. Yeah. It's, it's kind of astounding to me that there's groups of people and people of color, black people, who are pushing for segregation. We want to have separate college ceremonies. We want to have separate uh, whatever. I mean, you, you name it. We want to have all of this stuff just for us. So I would ask, who speaks for all black people? <laughs> Can I, like, like, does that person exist? No, they don't. But you know, the people that, are, that have been sending all these messages, they want to tell the black people in our congregation what to do. You should all, all get the, you don't speak for all the black people, sorry. Just like I don't speak for all the white people. Nobody speaks for an entire race of people. Amen. It's ridiculous. But yeah, they use that, they use that uh, definition instead of saying, look, it's not about the skin color. I mean, I was literally, and, and, and I'm not even saying that what I've experienced is the same level of racism that someone else might have experienced, right? So have I really been oppressed? No. But have I experienced racism? Yes. Against me? Sure I have. I had someone in, in South Phoenix and, and it's no surprise, it was in the area, area where uh, uh, Louis Farrakhan had a house. You know where that is, Brother Caleb? You know where that is, Solomon? It's, uh, it's over, to, like, oh, I forget exactly, maybe 20th Street. 
There's a, there's a neighborhood just north of, uh, of like Baseline or Southern. And, and anyways, it's, it's funny because it's not in the best neighborhood, but then like you can see his house is just like totally guarded and he's got these high fence, he's got a security guard and everything else. Anyways, I digress. It, <laughs> I was soloing in that area and, and I had this, this guy approach me and he was saying like, you white devil, you need to get out of here. You know, it's all this stuff. Like I didn't even talk to the guy and he's just already trying to run me out of the neighborhood because I'm white and I'm a white devil and I'm bringing my Bible around talking to people. It's like, dude, I'm, I'm preaching the gospel, man. But like, I tried to talk to him about it and he, I mean, the guy was almost ready to get violent. And he was a follower, a follower of Farrakhan and that's, you know, that's a lot of the stuff that, that he promotes and, and whatever. Anyways, I don't want to get too deep into that. Bottom line is though, race, racist people exist all over the place. No one is denying that. But how do we deal with that? What do we do? And oh, in, in another passage I had here in my notes that came to mind, when it comes to, you know, people being brought here as slaves, well, couldn't they have received the gospel? Never? Yes, they could have. But like I said, in 1,500 years, they didn't. But doesn't it make sense that it's still a better thing to be in a country where the gospel is being promoted the most? Amen. So what I mean by that is, in Romans chapter 3, the Bible says this. You can turn there if you'd like. Romans 3, verse number 1, the Bible says, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way. So in Romans 3, as Romans 3 is real big about saying there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, no difference between the Jew and the Gentile, you know, in Christ we're all one and all this stuff. But is there an advantage, at least was there an advantage at that time? Absolutely. There is an advantage to being a Jew. And he explains what that advantage was. He's much everywhere. Chiefly, so the most important reason why it was an advantage to be a Jew, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. God chose the nation of Israel to, to give, you know, to, to send the prophets out from and to reveal his word unto. And that word went out into all the world. Yes, but he was using that nation to be the nation of his people to be bringing forth the truth into the world. So that's why it's a good thing. You're going to be more likely to be exposed to the truth when you're in a nation that is bringing forth the fruits and bringing forth the gospel and teaching the word of God. Hands down, that's the best place you want to be. If you are able to have a choice of where can I be born without knowing anything and just saying, hey, I've got the highest odds of getting saved in this country, that's where I would want to be born. And I'd be willing to say this, if the choice was only between these two things, which this isn't real life, of course, there's many choices, many ways life can go. But if the choice was only, you can live this life where you are being enslaved, tortured, whatever, you know, like everything bad, you have nothing good, you have no possessions, people are mean to you, people spit on you, but when you die, you know, you, because you've called on Jesus Christ, you're going to be saved and go to heaven. Or you can have all the goods, all the riches, all the luxury, all the power, anything your heart could desire, but you're going to die and go to hell. It's a no-brainer. Right. It's a no-brainer. Heaven for eternity or what this world has to offer for a very short period of time. This is why we say it turned out good for many of the people who were enslaved because they received eternal life as a result of being in a country where you had all these evangelists that were going in and trying to preach the gospel to them. It's not that the gospel didn't work, you know, couldn't work in Africa. It could have, but that's not what happened. Jump down to the verse number seven, because this is another thing that's, where people are, are slandering us on a lot of things. Look at verse number seven, the Bible reads, for if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner and not rather as we be slanderously reported and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come whose damnation is just. So what were they saying about the, the apostles or about Paul? Because God provides salvation and because he's saying look if if the truth of god is still 
abounding even in spite of the lies or whatever, does that mean, you know, if God uses bad for good, essentially, does that mean that we should just do a bunch of bad so that good can come? It's very similar to Romans chapter 5 that talks about, you know, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So should we just keep on sinning to bring in more grace? No, God forbid. So the same way here, even back then, you had people slandering and saying that, oh, they're saying that in order for these people to get saved, they need to be slaves and they need to... No, that's not what we're saying. But people are literally saying that to us. That's what you believe. So in order for these people to say, if they had to just become slaves, they, no. So we should just enslave everybody so that they could be saved. No. But look, that's the way it was back then, and that's the same thing that people are doing today. Just completely abusing and misstating what we believe. And for what benefit, I don't know. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And I'll say this, too. Be careful with the words that you use, and you start accusing people of stuff. You better know what you're talking about. And the more people throw around words, like one of the words that's been thrown around now for a long time is Nazi. When you start applying labels to people, that have nothing to do or even look like anywhere close to the people you're trying to call them, you are cheapening that word and making it meaningless. Yeah. You're making it meaningless. So when you start calling us, me, our church, you know, this group of racists and, and KKK members and all these other things that we've heard, and then people look at us or come and actually visit our church, you've made that word of no effect. It becomes meaningless. It, you know, then when you actually call real racist a racist, it doesn't matter because you're calling everyone a racist. So now how are you even going to know who's really racist and who isn't when you just apply that label to everybody? It's stupid. You're only doing damage to the cause that you want to help. You want to point out the racism, point out the real racism. Don't just throw words around. You know, our identity, turn if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I kind of brought this up before. Another commonality that I see, and not just in our comments, but I see this in general, it's the same notion of, to a much simpler and, and I guess, more comical application, you know, in this state, we have some professional sports teams, right? Like the Atlanta Falcons. And when they play a football game, oftentimes people will say, we won, right? Because they're identifying themselves with the football players that played a game where they won the victory, right? Now, I don't care if people say that. It's not like a big deal. But it's something that people do. You start identifying with other groups and other people and then you're including yourself as being like as if you had anything to do with that victory. Like you really didn't, right? I think the players won the victory. Like you didn't, right? They trained and put forth the effort and played the game and, and, and won. Like you really didn't add anything to that. But to, on a more serious note, people do that also with their heritage and they associate themselves with people who lived in the past and going back many, many, many years. Right? And this is where people start getting in, where I see the problem where it's your people. Right? So, like I was saying earlier, oh, I'm white, so your people did this to my people. And if you say anything about slaves, it's how dare you say that about my people. And they're, and they're, and they're associating themselves with this group and then taking it personally and then getting really triggered and really upset because. It becomes impossible to have a discussion about things that happen in a truthful manner about people that now all of a sudden you say, well, this is my people, so you're saying that about me. No. So because they got enslaved and they got, you know, so you're saying I got to be enslaved? No. We're talking about the facts. We're talking about things that happened, right? We ought to identify as Christians at, since we are Christians. And, you know, the color of your skin and, and associating with your, your physical heritage, that's the flesh. 
why do you want to identify with the flesh? I mean, my heritage, I, like, I, I'm not a Latvian American, even though my grandparents are from Latvia. I don't consider myself a Polish American because the other side of my family is from Poland. I just consider myself an American because this is where I am and this is where I was born. And on the same token, I don't see people as African American. You were born in this country, you're in this country, you've been in this country for, you know, your generations have been in this country, you're an American. I don't see Christians as, like, like there's, there's a group of Messianic Jews. Why are you Messianic Jews? Why aren't you just a Christian? Like, why do you have to have all these differentiations? It's, you know, it's like, look, once you're saved, once you become a Christian, that's who you should be as a Christian. Because everyone that's saved in this room, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Regardless of what tone you have on your body. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things are become new. You're a new creature. You, have a, you are a heavenly person now. Your home is in heaven. You ought to view things different. You don't need to cling to all this other stuff, to the heritage of the best. Why do you want to cling to a voodoo religion? Why do you want to cling to, to multiple gods or some other history that you've had? Cling to the truth, cling to the word of God, cling to your salvation, cling to the things of God, and move forward with a new, fresh mindset. Amen. So many things. And, uh, turn, if you would, to... Titus chapter 3. I'll close on this. It's, it's already been a while now. I've got, I've got plenty of other points that I wanted to bring up. but and These are all the comments from like a few minutes that was preached. So I'm, I'm kind of, if you could believe that. I'll throw these things out there without just completely fleshing them out. Probably get in trouble for that. But I, I just think it's interesting, too, you know, with the generalizations and people that want to say, your people, my people. Well, was every white person in this country a slave owner and believe in slavery in the past? What, is that true? So how do you know if my ancestors owned slaves or not? How do you know if my ancestors actually didn't fight to free slaves? Because I'll let you in on a little secret. There wasn't this huge revolution of the slaves overthrowing the authority and, and, and fighting for their freedom in that regard. That didn't happen. Instead, there were a lot of white people that fought for the emancipation of people who were in bondage and in slavery. And people like that existed going all the way back through the colonies and all the way through to today. So you can't just look at someone and just think you know their story and think you know anything about them the same way that many people are getting offended. You don't know what I've been through. Brother Devin said, hey, get over it. Amen. And you know what? I say amen to that too. Get over it. I don't know what you've been through, and you don't know what I've been through. But you know what the Bible teaches is to say, hey, get up, right? If you fall, get back up again and, keep, and just serve the Lord in whatever position you're in and wherever God has placed you. Be content with what you have and move forward and serve the Lord. And get over it and stop murmuring and complaining over all the injustices that have been done in the past. I'm not saying don't fight injustice. I'm just saying don't be sitting there complaining about it all. Get over it and start moving forward and do something. Amen. But it makes a lot of people feel really good about themselves to just try to tear down everything they see on the internet. Get over it. Do something. You don't need reparations. Which that's a whole other topic. How, how would you even go about doing it? Like I said, how would you know what, what side of the fence people were on? 
going all the way back to when bad things happen to people. How could you possibly know that? I mean, I could say, hey, I'm off the hook. My, my, descendant, my ancestors weren't even in this country during that time. And, and today of all time, and this is why this is appropriate for today. I believe this, anybody can be successful, if you even just talk about the world's definition of successful in this country today. I don't care where you're from. First generation immigrants that come here with nothing can make their way and earn a living and do well. So they say, get over it, get to work, and stop complaining about things and stop looking for handouts and just get to work. I don't care what color your skin is. And maybe there are people out there, and I'm sure there are, that may not want to hire you because of how you look. That's the way the world works. We can preach about it being wrong and everything else, but you know what? They're going to be out there. And you, instead of spending your time complaining, 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 how about you just go and, and find some other work then? In this country, there's plenty of work to be had. You'll find something somewhere. You definitely, or else you're not looking. I do turn to Titus 3 9 because, you know, at the end of the day, our ancestry and stuff like that, it doesn't matter. The Bible says in Titus 3 9, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they're unprofitable and vain. Avoid your genealogy. Who cares? Who cares what your ancestry was? So, uh, 1 Timothy 1 4 says the same thing. Basically, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. That's what the Bible teaches. Don't worry about the ancestry. Don't worry about the carnal and the physical stuff. John the Baptist taught to the, to the Pharisees who were trusting, and because and, we also had some black Hebrew Israelites commenting as well, so I'll throw this one out there. Again, and, and I talk about a racist group. I mean, it's just all about the race to them. It's all about the color. It's insane. And trying to talk sense to them is, is almost like a fool's errand. It's really, really difficult. I mean, it's really hard. It, it's, it, yeah. But, you know, John the Baptist said this, bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance and begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So does it really matter if you're a physical descendant of Abraham? If you're a Hebrew? The answer is no. Not according to scripture. That's why we don't look back at genealogy. And that's why the, John the Baptist is saying, look, don't trust in that. Because God can take these stones and raise up seed unto Abraham. No big deal. Doesn't matter. I'll close with Hebrews 13, verse number 5. The Bible says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. That's the mindset that we ought to have. Let's be content with such things as we have, right? Wherever you're at, be content with that. And knowing God's never going to leave you or forsake you. That's comforting. So if you have nothing, God's still there with you. That's a great message. That's good news. I can be content because I know that God's still with me. And that we may boldly say, hey, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Just move forward and serve Christ. Don't look to serve your belly. Don't look to serve, you know, serve Christ. That's what we're called to do. And you know what? We can all join together in a common goal, which is what we're doing here in this church, which is why I, I, I you know, posted that picture up yesterday to, to our social media, to Facebook, just to show people, look, we're unified here. Amen. People said, oh, I can't believe they said this in front of black people. Like, yeah, and you know what? I'm saying this today in front of black people, in front of brown people, in front of white people. For, I mean, no, no one has gotten up and walked out. But you're all scared, right? 
That's, that's what it is. That's what it, ah, see, I know. Or, and, and this is, I, I actually responded too, because here's the thing. It, it's funny when, when people want to say all this stuff. And I mentioned, hey, we've got plenty of people. I mean, we have a huge, diverse church here. And, and, but here's the thing, like, we don't have to. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, right? We happen, we happen to have a great, but what if we lived in an area that just wasn't very diverse? I think the reason why we have such diversity here is because Gwinnett County is super diverse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. Yeah. What if we lived in an area that was only white people and we just had a whole bunch of white people in church? Well, does that matter? No. What if you live in an area that was just a whole bunch of black people and you just had a whole bunch of black people in church? Does that matter? No. Who cares? It doesn't matter. But the point I was going to make was this, is that, you know, people are saying, oh, black, because this is, goes to the point of speaking like for all black people. Oh, those black people should all get up and leave. So wh what if they don't? Does that mean they're stupid? They don't see what you see. I mean, so like, th does that make them dumb? Are they ignorant? What does that make them? Or are they racist too? I asked that question and it's just like, they don't want to answer that. No one wants to answer that. No, people can actually have differing views, and you don't have to speak for everybody. And you know what the people here that aren't walking out, it's because they listened to the whole sermon, and they understood what was being expressed. Amen. I mean, I, I think the church speaks for itself. If we're a racist church, then show me one that's not. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I mean, who are we racist against? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're a racist church, but like we're just full of all different colors of people. Okay, sure. Yeah, that's reality. All right, let's bow our heads up a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for the great truths in your word. God, I pray that you please help us to, to grow. I pray that you please help us to reach the lost. I pray that you would please help us uh, to use our brains and to, and to seek out a matter and not answer a matter before we hear it and that we would get the context in which things are being said always, Lord, even with people with, that say things that we don't agree with or they're contrary to us, dear Lord, that we wouldn't jump to conclusions or make false assumptions or just think that we know everything about someone else. We didn't, when we don't, dear Lord, I pray that you please help us to uh, be rational, be reasonable, to use our minds to hear out a matter. And um, Lord, help us also just to be clear when we preach your word and that uh, there is no misunderstanding of, of what's being taught. And especially, Lord, please help us to preach your word in truth. And God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.